Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, I'm sick. So, I'm going to cheer myself up and upgrade our in win B1 system and give it a little bit more juice. Keep watching to find out how. Okay, so in today's video, there will probably be some sniffing, some coughing, and some uh, Wall Street eyes. I am a little bit sick, I do apologise, so do bear with me. Um, the brain's not working properly either. Head colds typically do that to me, but anyway. So in today's video, we've got our Inwin B1. We've also got our Gigabyte Aorus B450iAC Pro Wi-Fi, or whatever the thing is called these days. And basically, because we're upgrading it, we're gonna have to do a BOSS update. So if you've come here looking for how to do a BOSS update on that particular motherboard, don't worry, we've got you covered. Look at the timestamps in the video description. You can fast forward to that bit if that is the bit you're interested in. For the rest of you, this is going to be a little bit of a meandering journey of the upgrade from the Ryzen 3 2200G up to the whopping Ryzen 7 5700G. So it's going to have a lot more cores, a lot more threads, and a little bit better graphics performance, and generally be snappier overall. Now, I have been running the system for the last probably year, year and a half, maybe, possibly even slightly more. It doesn't get a great deal of use, and part of the reason of that is because the cores are actually pretty slow. The Ryzen 3 2200G is fine, gets the job done, and for some games is absolutely usable. And in fact, I'll give you some examples of gameplay here. So we've got things like Rocket League, which runs absolutely fine. You can tweak the settings. Also, uh, Cyberpunk. Believe it or not, Cyberpunk does actually run at the lowest settings, although it is cinematic gameplay. And other things like Far Cry New Dawn, those kinds of titles are absolutely fine. Again, the frame rate isn't exactly stellar, but it gets the job done. And normal things like web browsing, etc., and even running Cinebench, it obviously it can do it, but it's just particularly slow. Four cores these days with no extra hyper threads makes for a relatively sluggish system. Coupled with the fact that we've got some slightly older RAM in here, which is running at DDR4 2666 speeds, uh, reason being is because, again, didn't get a lot of use, so I thought, well, there's no point putting anything too elaborate or extravagant in there. Just get the job done. 2666 is absolutely fine. And when the Ryzen 3 2200G first came out, it didn't actually like faster RAM speeds anyway, especially nothing over 3200, whereas now you can run it pretty much as fast as you like and it's absolutely fine. Part of that is down to BIOS updates and uh, things like that. So again, the BIOS update that we're going to be doing is going to improve performance hopefully a little bit and add some more features. Another reason why this doesn't get a great deal of use is it's running Windows 10. I prefer to use Windows 11. Kill me in the comment section. But at the moment, as it stands, again, because of the BIOS on this, I can't even install Windows 11 because it doesn't have the TPM support, secure boot, and all those kinds of things which are included with some of the later BIOS updates. Yet another reason why this thing doesn't get a great deal of use is actually it's got a relatively small drive in there. There's a Kioxia 240GB SSD in there, which is absolutely fine, again, for just general purpose, internet browsing, that sort of thing, and maybe the odd game or two. It's absolutely fine, but we're going to increase the storage and also the speeds and we're going to install the new Kingston NV2 NVMe drive. This is a NVMe drive running PCI Express Gen 4 times 4 This board only supports Gen 3, so we're not going to get the best out of it. But certainly, considering the price at the moment, it's pretty much the best bang per buck at somewhere around the £40 mark. Also, something else which we might do at the same time, because we're upgrading the processor and the 5000 series do run a little bit hotter. Potentially, we might upgrade the cooler as well. So I have got our Noctua NHL9 which is a really good cooler, a bit expensive, and certainly not really worth using with the Ryzen 3 2200G. But for the 5700G, this might make a valid improvement. It's a little bit of a pain to install, so we'll see how things go. You have to take out the motherboard and all that kind of stuff, which uh, kind of sucks when you're in a smaller case. So, there is the parts, uh, essentially. I've done a new PC part picker list. With all this included, all the upgrades, basically, this is going to be somewhere in the region of about just under £600, so it's actually a ton of money considering it is only a little tiny ITX system and no actual graphics card, but it should be considerably faster and as with most things, if you do want to miniaturize your PC, keep it quiet, etc., you do have to pay the money. I'll put the link in the video description so if you wanna check out it for yourself, you can. Obviously, there's gonna be some things which you can omit. Like This is 50 quid. The RAM that I've chosen for this is the Thermaltake Tough RAM, which, it is quite expensive for what it is, and it never really seems to drop in price for some reason. So you can get cheaper RAM kits like that if you want to. So you could probably get it done for some of the region about 450, give or take. So yeah, anyway, we're going with the best we possibly can to give this thing the uh, send off it deserves. Right, let's get on with it. Okay, so let's 
go ahead first of all and let's get the BIOS updated because before we strip things down the system is actually working and the system needs to be working in order for you to flash the BIOS so let's go ahead to the website links for this will be in the video description as well for the update so this is the B450i Aorus Pro Wi-Fi Rev1 I don't think they actually did a different reversion so there's all the specs etc as you expect to get the BIOS update go over to support and depending on the processor you're going to be using if you go to CPU support you can scroll down through and have a look through, see if you can find your processor on here. Uh, we're going to be using the Ryzen 7 5700G, and there's the specifications for it. So this is going to require BIOS version F61. So let's go and see which downloads are available. BIOS, so there's 19 BIOSes available for this. Mad. So 61 is that one there. So that was released uh, June, July last year. So yeah, we can definitely do a little bit better than that. So we've got 62, 63A, so that's updates for the 5900, uh, 5800X rather. And we've got the latest one here. So this has got the very latest AGISA version two, uh, 1.2.0.8. And this is actually from the 9th of February, 2023. So that's uh, just over a month old. So that should be absolutely fine. So that's the one we're gonna go with. Obviously again, depending on the processor you're using, go with what you need. I'm guessing for a lot of people, if you're going up to and including the 5800X 3D, which is the latest and greatest on AM4, then F63A is the kind of the newest one for that. But we'll go with this top one. So we'll click on download and we'll download it to our desktop location. It's going to be a zip file, so we're going to need to unzip it. So we can minimize this window. There's our BIOS file. So right click, choose extract all and extract the file. And there is the auto exec back file. BIOS file itself, you can tell that because it's the largest file. So you can actually do the BIOS flash from within Windows using the um, EFI flash.exe, or you can do it from the BIOS, which is how we're gonna end up doing it. So we're just gonna need this file here. So I'm gonna grab a USB drive. There is the drive, so there is our blank drive. It's always a good idea with these type of things. Right click, format the drive, choose FAT32 if it isn't already, so ours is, but I'm gonna format it again anyway just be on the safe side obviously if you've got data on there you can't do that you don't necessarily have to i don't think it reads ntfs drives though so do make sure it's fat32 or possibly xfat once you're happy you can get this file so we're going to copy that file and send it across to our usb drive so right click choose paste and there we go so that is our bars file so now we can remove that from the system go over to the computer and start flashing the bios Okay, so we've got the system back up and running now. Got the USB drive plugged into the front of our system, which uh, hopefully I can just about get in the shot. There we go. No, oh, you can't really see it, is there? It's too dark. So this is our BIOS. Press delete to get into the BIOS. And then what you want to do is to navigate to the uh, BIOS section up here. Or you can just go to actually from the, uh, the start menu, you can go into QFlash. Double click on that. So you've got the option there for updating the BIOS. So if you want to do that, you can choose to save the BIOS if you want to, but we're just going to choose update the BIOS. And that is our BIOS file there. 64A, as we've said earlier. So just double click on that one. And it will ver verify the file, which it did very quickly. And then it gives you the option to press to start. I wonder if this actually touchscreen works. No, it doesn't work in the BIOS. Didn't think it would. So click on press to start. And there we go. So now it's updating the bar. So just leave the system alone, let it get on, do its thing. It will probably take somewhere in the region of about four minutes or so to do the whole process. So at this point you can just go away and have a cup of tea. Okay, so that is done. And at the end it'll say reboot in one or two seconds. So it's gonna reboot. You probably gonna to need to reset your CMOS. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on tapping the delete key. So I'm going to go back into the BIOS just to make sure that the BIOS version has taken before we go ahead and strip things down because otherwise that's going to be an absolute pain. You'll we'll probably have to do memory training etc again because it's uh, basically a new bar so all the previous settings will be lost. So I'm going to keep on tapping the delete key until we get our bar screen come up. Probably going to reboot a couple of times, memory training, etc. There we go. 
So clear CMOS information, BAS has been reset. Please reconfigure the BAS setup if needed. So click on OK and you go back into the BAS. And if we look on the BAS version, which I believe is in system. Yeah, so there we go. BAS version F64-A, release date the 9th of February, 2023. So we're all good. And it's kept the time and date, etc. Obviously, when we come to um, configure the system, once the new CPU is in, we can go in and change all of the uh, settings for the BAS, etc. I'll go through, do all that. But in terms of actually updating the BAS, that is it. That's all we need to do. And I pro should probably say, I'm probably going to split this into a separate video as well. So if you've got any problems or comments or questions on this segment of the video or the actual BAS flash, let us know in the video comments and uh, we'll see what we can do or potentially join our Discord. But for those of you that are going to carry on and watch the rest of it, let's get on and do the upgrade. Okay, so now you can see me in the reflection of the glass. That's uh, an interesting camera shot. Probably not the best I've ever done. Anyway, time to upgrade this thing. So first thing we need to do is to uh, flip her over. And there's a couple of screws here and here. So just using a uh, pH screwdriver, Phillips head one or Phillips head two. I think the Phillips head one is probably the better for this particular instance. And let's take off the cover. And that will reve reveal even, if I could say it, our Kioxia uh, Xeria drive. So press down this tab, which is just here and the drive should pull backwards a little bit. If it doesn't, you can get a flat bladed screwdriver and uh, gently twist down in this section here and just each side, give it a little wiggle and it will push it away. It's actually locked in pretty well on this design. So there we go. So pull it off. What holds it in place? These uh, four little screws on the base there. So that is that bit done. So that is our old drive taken out. Now, obviously if you need to do anything to your drive, i.e. in terms of actually cloning the data, etc. Now this is obviously a good time to do it. For us, I'm going to just go with a uh, like a fresh install or basically another install from the other system I've already got. So I don't have to worry about that too much. So that's the drive removed and now we can go ahead and flip it back over and actually put in the new drive. Now in order to take off the lid on the back of this little box, you've got a couple of screws there and there. Again, you can use a PH1 or PH2 screwdriver. Uh, it's a little bit narrow trying to get into it there. So a longer stem or shaft, as they say, would be beneficial. But you've heard that before. And to remove the glass top, there is a little section here and here, like a little lug. So what we do is just push those up a little bit and it should pop off. There we go, finally. So that takes the top off and reveals the, uh, the internals. So as you've probably seen from some B-roll earlier, this is what we've got. So we need to remove this shield. Let's put our M.2 drive in. We're also going to need to take out our uh, slightly skanky RAM, the TimeTech green PCB. Not seen stuff like that for a while. And we're going to obviously need to remove the CPU cooler, take that out, and potentially we might need to take the whole motherboard out if we choose to put the, uh, the other cooler in. I might run with this jellied one just for the time being, just to see how it goes, but we'll, uh, we'll see what the deal is there. It is a bit of a pain with this because once you undo those screws, the M4 backplate just drops off. So I might have to take the back off again just to hold the back plate in place in order for the uh, CPU cooler to work. A little bit of an oversight on this particular design. They should have given you better access to the back of it really, but it does make some of the kind of um, the structural support of the thing. So anyway, let's get on and put our drives in. Okay, so now it's time to install the drive. So we've got our Kingston drive, our NVMe, which is gonna sit underneath this bit here. So grab a screwdriver, again, PH1 or PH2. PH1 is probably your best bet. And there is a mounting screw there for the NVMe drive. So pull that out and then you can lift off the, uh, the metal shield and remove that, take it out of the way. This will reveal the uh, mounting section for your drive itself. So let's put the drive in first of all. So this slides in the M.2 
ports just there. Give it a little wiggle and it should pop in. And a little bit of pressure there and it should lock into place on the pin on the back. If it doesn't, it's a bit of a pain because you kind of want to hold it in place because on the back of here you've got the kind of adhesive pad or sticky pad which actually keeps it in place. So slot that back in. There's a little lug at the bottom there. Has that gone in? Wait. Or has it? Yep, that's gone in. So you just place it down on top and then you grab your little screw again, preferably the magnetic screwdriver, and just do that up until you hit a hard wall. And then that is basically it. That's your M.2 drive installed. Whilst we're in this location, we can take the RAM out on this particular board. It's two clips at the top. So move those and we can pull those out. And we'll quickly put our new RAM back in. The RAM we're installing is going to be the uh, Thermaltake DDR4-3600 Tough RAM RGB. I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure whether or not it's going to actually work with this motherboard because it is quite a high frequency for a B450. But uh, it looks really nice. It's a very cool RAM, so I'm going to go with it and see what happens. So there's one stick in. And there's the other. I'll move that out of the way. So that is the, uh, the RAM installed. Oh, that's cool. Nice looking RAM. Uh, now we can actually get to the processor part of things. So we're going to undo the screws on our CPU cooler. And when you're undoing spring mounted ones, ideally you want to do it in opposing corners. A few screws at a time. Until you may hear the back plate literally just fall away which it may or may not do. I think that has loosened enough. I can't remember if I actually put a little bit of super glue on the back of the motherboard to actually hold that in place. I may well have done that. So let's give it a little bit of a twist just to try and separate the, uh, the thermal paste, the cooler onto the CPU. So. We'll just give it a look. Oh, there we go. Finally. So that was uh, stuck on there pretty dang well. And it's uh, it's not hardened. Well, it has very slightly, but it's, I think I must have used a bit of a cheaper paste on there because it has uh, gone very sticky. I would suggest if you are using any thermal paste these days, do yourself a favor, get yourself over some Noctua paste or some uh, MX4 which is much less glue-like, whereas this, I'm not sure what I use, but that is uh, very gluey. don't like that at all. Anyway, so let's take this out and uh, we'll clean up the sockets, clean up the CPU. There's a little bit of a blob there, remove that. And I think there's a little bit more down there. Yeah, we'll give this a little bit of a clean up with some isopropyl alcohol and some wipes, and then we'll put a new layer of thermal paste on our new processor. And there we go, just so you uh, you can see that it is actually, well, it's upside down, but there you go, it's our Ryzen, Ryzen 3 2200G, which typically the light, ah, there we go, 2200G, old faithful. So you press the lever down, move the lever out slightly, and lift up, and you should hear a little bit of a click as it disengages. Now let's see if we can get that little bit of uh, goop off the side. A bit like me trying to blow my nose at the moment. So let's uh, remove our processor, take that out of the way, put it somewhere safe. And there we go, there is our new CPU, the Ryzen 7 5700G. Arguably the fastest APU that AMD have produced. In fact, the fastest APG, APU that you can buy, I think. That may change this summer when uh, AMD bring out the M5 version of APUs, which promise to be very good, but they're not here yet. So this, in the moment, is the best we've got. So let's stick that into the socket. That's dropped in. You can push the lever down. And there we go, there is our CPU installed. So let's get some thermal paste on. 
I was unsure whether to go with the Noctua or go with the uh, MX4, but good friend of the channel, Rick H, uh, sent us the NTH2 10 gram thermal paste, so we'll stick some Noctua on there. So I'm just going to put some of this on our CPU. That should be more than enough. And I'm going to see how well this spreads. Some pastes don't spread particularly well. We'll see what this is like. It's nice to get a nice thin coat in. Yeah, that seems to spread pretty okay. So we get a nice thin application all the way across. It's a little bit uh, not quite as thin as the uh, Arctic MX4. So I don't want to go all the way to the edges, just to make sure that there's a, a decent bit there. Oh, actually made it worse there. So yeah, the uh, looks like the thermal paste doesn't like to be uh, manipulated very much. So to be on the safe side, I'm going to put another little dollop in the middle there, just so it can squish out and fill any of these gaps that I may have introduced. And we'll get the uh, the cooler cleaned up and get that installed. So there is our cooler, it's the Gelid cooler. And as you can see, that has uh, gunked up pretty badly. So let's clean up that. Only two heat pipes on this. It is rated up to, I think about 100 watts, I believe, or 95 watts. And our CPU's only got a TDP of 65 watts, so that should be fine. And if need be, we can always swap it out later for the, uh, the other one. We'll see how it goes. So as you can see, the uh, AM4 backplate is actually hanging in on in there. So we've got some of the uh, backplate there exposed. And you can see it is dropping down a little bit. Luckily, with this gelid cooler, actually, it's got pretty long screws, so they uh, pretty much meet up. So I might get away with not having to do, do the installation again on there. I'm just trying to see where the CPU header is actually for the cooler. It's been such a long time since I've done anything with this. Ah, yeah. It's down in this bottom corner, hidden away. So maybe I'm going to plug that in first of all. Probably run that underneath there. And let's just place this on approximately over the top of the screw holes. Actually, that wasn't a bad job. So with this, because they, it is going to be such close contact, I'm just going to do maybe one or two screws just to keep it in place until we get it started. So I don't have to use too much pressure. Good there. I think it's gripped. Yeah, that's gripped. Excellent stuff. So if you do that, just do a couple of turns each side. If your back plate's one of those which is a little bit temperamental, potentially going to move around, then uh, that's a good way of not having to actually physically hold the back plate in place. It does help actually with this, like I said, with Jelly because it has got particularly long thread screws which. Uh, Helps in this instance massively. And there we go, that's all fully tightened down. So all I need to do now is to do a little bit of uh, cable management and uh, we can get this thing fired back up and see what it's like. Okay, so the BIOS update is taken and it's uh, eventually booted back up. So we are greeted with the American Megatrends BIOS or AMI BIOS. And you'll generally get this if you install a new CPU, especially with modern systems supporting FTPM, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'll say here, saying that the FTPM, PSP, NV structure has changed. Now, obviously, this is a warning message and it's a little bit uh, obtuse or non-descriptive, but basically you've changed your processor. So because you've changed your processor, your FTPM values have changed because it's built into the processor. 
So you have the option to press Y to reset the FTPM. If you have BitLocker or encryption enabled on your Windows installation, if you're swapping an existing installation, uh, the system won't boot without using your recovery key, which no doubt you failed to make a copy of because nobody does. Alternatively, you can press N and keep your previous FTM record and continue with the system boot. So in most cases, pressing N is actually the best way forward. You can basically go back in and swap over your processor to recover your TPM related keys and data, etc. If you haven't got encryption or you're doing a fresh installation, then just press Y and then it will reboot and we get to see the Elgato sign. And what we want to do now is to keep on pressing the delete keys just so we can set up our BIOS. And there we go. So again, it's cleared the CMOS. So we can go in and now we can reconfigure our settings. And there isn't going to be a great deal we're going to do here. Essentially, pretty much all I want to do is to change things like the memory settings. So we're going to go in and choose memory settings. And we're going to turn on our XMP. And we'll choose profile one. So DDR4. That should be absolutely fine. I'm not entirely sure if it's going to actually be able to use that. So frequency settings, we'll leave everything else as it is for the CPU. And in the advanced CPU settings, I don't think there's anything really I need to change. I think that's going to be absolutely fine. Um, I am going to turn on virtual machine now because Windows 11 and the core isolation feature for security. That's worth doing. Uh, what else we got? Booting. So that should boot from our main drive. That's fine. Yeah, I think that is going to be okay. We could go into AMD overclocking and do some undervolting and that kind of stuff but I'd rather just get the system actually working and stable before we tweak any more settings. So I think that is going to be pretty much it. Something I will turn on is ERP because it's a media center PC so you want the lights and USBs to turn off when the system's either in sleep or whatever so we'll leave as it is and uh, we'll save and exit and hopefully we should uh, Get back into windows it'll probably do some memory training again so we'll let it train the memory and uh, fingers crossed for a boot scenario otherwise it's going to reboot about four or five times until it finally gives up and then it will uh, reset the xmp settings back to being switched off and that would be it looks like it's going to be okay appears that windows is loading happy days and there we go we are back into windows Looks like we've got a connection there. Uh, I'm not too sure what resolution this is now in. Looks a little weird. Oh wow. Yeah, that is an odd resolution. So let's change that back to uh, 1080. And we'll keep those settings. But yeah, it looks like uh, everything is A-OK. -okay. Literally, it's just a CPU swap, so it shouldn't be... Uh, the end of the world. I suspect the uh, display change there is going from the Vega 7 or whatever it is in the 2200G to the Vega 8, so probably just a, a brief lapse there. We'll check in Device Manager, make sure that everything is looking good. A couple of reboots will probably be necessary. Yeah, there we go. Our AMD Radeon TM graphics is not installed at the moment, so we're going to go ahead and install the Radeon drivers, and then we'll do some uh, benchmarking and see what the gameplay is actually like. Okay, so we've finished the upgrade and it's uh, it's not been pleasant, to be completely honest with you. It's been an absolute nightmare and it's involved me uh, cutting chunks of the case out. And I've come to the realisation that the 5700G is possibly a little bit much for this tiny little in-win B1 case. Now, I have seen other people that have used it and it's been absolutely fine, although I have been slightly unfair to it. It's relatively warm in here at about 23 degrees Celsius. And also I have been running Cinebench R23 on there and stressing the bejesus out of all the cores and all the threads. And it's been getting towards the 90 degrees Celsius mark even after I've cut some chunks out. And I've also swapped out the CPU cooler. The uh, Gelid, unfortunately, didn't quite cut the mustard. And to be honest with you, even the Noctua, the N9 or the L9 or whatever it is, uh, you'll probably see in the B-roll from that as well, it's struggling. There is such a drastic amount of kind of almost like a vacuum inside this little case that it really is struggling. And the glass on the side, even now, it's not really running anything, it's just idling. It's just taking ages to actually get back down to an ambient temperature. And weirdly, actually just idle, uh, this is sitting around about 40 degrees Celsius, which is a little bit on the high side. But take the top panel off, take the glass off, 
and you can get it closer to 30, 32 degrees, so much, much better. And you can possibly tell already the fans, well, I'm just, I'm not too far away from it. I've actually unplugged the top fan because it's just ridiculously warm. So that is just the main one. And you can see it's just, yeah, it's basically doing nothing. I'm not sure if it's actually doing something in the background, some kind of update, but it seems to be gradually losing control of what it can actually do. So definitely there is a potential that I might have to change out the case, which is something that I don't want to have to do because I actually weirdly quite like the look of this case even though to some people it looks like some kind of air fryer. But saying that, air fryers these days are very much in vogue, so maybe that's a good thing. But I'm happy to say that the gaming performance is significantly better, albeit significantly warmer. And actually, before we go on to too much further, I've just briefly paused then and taken the lid off, and effectively we have silence, so much so that the fan is actually stopped, so yes much much better i can actually hear myself think now it's not a terrible noise it's just annoying and this is the uh, the section i cut out from here hoping that just a little bit of extra airflow would help i think it's just one of those things where there just isn't enough direct airflow going through the chassis with the 2200g absolutely fine and because it wasn't generating enough heat it was it was great, but I think this has pushed it a little bit too far. Potentially, I might have to look at some curve optimization, reduce some voltages, that kind of stuff. But overall, the gaming performance has been significantly better. And we're looking at anywhere between about 25% to 50% improvement overall. And if we take a look at some of the games here, so we've got Cyberpunk 2077. And this is running much, much better. Uh, we're a little bit up from the cinematic 25 frames per second. We were with the 2200G and now we're at 3540 in places so yeah that is a definite improvement it feels much much smoother looks nicer and the input actually does feel smoother as well there's less latency less lag all that kind of stuff which you associate with those lower frame rates because basically the processor is screaming out for help other titles such as rocket league play much much better again we've gone from somewhere in the region of about 40 to 50 frames per second now all these tests are done at 1080p there's no render resolution scaling and it's basically at either low, medium, or high settings, depending on the game. For Rocket League, we're on a kind of a quality preset. So it's uh, not the highest quality, but it is a quality preset. So we are getting lower frames than we would normally. But we've jumped from somewhere in the region of about 40 to 60 to somewhere between 60 to 100, and basically staying towards the kind of 80 to 100 more times than not. So definitely an impressive improvement there, and it feels much, much smoother. Another big improvement, Far Cry New Dawn, again, 1080p, no scaling whatsoever, and originally we were on low. We could potentially even push this up a little bit higher to medium, maybe even high if you're kind of more into those cinematic frame rates, but we can hit a constant 60 here pretty easily at low. If you crank it up to medium, then around right about 30 to 40 is going to be what you're going to see. Obviously, you can tweak the settings even more, maybe turn down anti-aliasing, things like that, which do have a little bit of a performance impact on here. But overall, the performance is much, much better, much, much smoother, and there doesn't seem to be any kind of real problems with frame timing either. Wreckfest has also seen a massive improvement, and we've gone from 1080p low down to 1080p medium, so increased fidelity, and also we're getting some seriously better frame rates. Before, it was a little bit kind of off-putting at times, but this is a much, much smoother experience, and you can expect to see anywhere between 60 and 100 frames per second pretty much constantly, so it runs much, much better. Occasionally, you will get the odd dip, but that is one of those things. Unfortunately, with this particular setup, there doesn't appear to be anywhere in the motherboard's BIOS to allow me to allocate more virtual RAM or VRAM to the actual graphic side of the APU, which is unfortunate, so it is doing it dynamically. I think if we were managing to allocate some fixed RAM to it, that might be better. Something I possibly need to take a closer look into at a later date, although at the moment I've done so many things with this, trying to keep it cool, it's been an absolute nightmare. Now looking at temperatures, again, like I said, with this cooler on, we're looking at somewhere about 30 to 32 degrees at idle with it open. With the top on, we're looking at about 40. When you actually run the Cinebench stress test, again, we're looking at 90 degrees Celsius. I have set a thermal throttle actually in the BIOS to, at 95, just in case whilst I was running any tests and doing other things around the house, I didn't really want it to get over to 95, because that is a little bit too much, I feel, and is the T-junction temperature for this particular processor, so I don't want it hitting that. It didn't seem to want to go any much further over 90, maybe 90 and a half, 
which is a little bit better than it was previously, and the scores were a little bit better as well. We gained an extra 200 points in Cinebench. Again, the real limitation of this, unfortunately, is going to be this chassis, which is a real shame. So I think I'm going to have to either resort to putting the 2200G back in here, which I'm not really keen on doing. Maybe going for something a little bit lower, maybe a 5600G, which we've used before, which you can check out the videos of. And actually, I think I did temperature test with this, or possibly its sibling, the uh, Chopin, which is... Uh, mesh fronted so much much better but potentially maybe even a 32 or 3400 g possibly let me know what you think in the comments section below i think this is going to pretty much wrap this up it was a little bit of a kind of boss update video really but i wanted to do these other things to see what this little chassis was capable of and unfortunately i think with the 5700 g it's kind of met its match but let me know what you think about this one in the comments section below but for now i've been mike this is mike's unboxing reviews and how to and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.